The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Post-pandemic economic recovery depends on getting businesses back on track. That's hard with air, sea and rail freight tangled and even stalled. Tonight, what has scrambled global supply chains and do we need a made in Canada solution? We'll explore that. Then we'll hear from professor, writer and former liberal leader Michael Ignatiev on his new book that finds wisdom and solace for our trying times in the experience of centuries past. It's Wednesday, November 17th, and that's ahead on the agenda. From toys to technology to the all-important auto sector, Canadian manufacturing and retail depend on imports and exports on a global scale. However, amidst the pandemic, what were mostly seamless just-in-time distribution networks have succumbed to some worrying vulnerabilities. On what we've learned from the disruption in global supply chains, we welcome, in the nation's capital, Perrin Beatty. He's president and CEO of the Canadian Chamber of Commerce and a former cabinet minister to three different prime ministers. In Waterloo, Ontario, Besma Momani, professor of political science at the University of Waterloo and a senior fellow at CG, the Centre for International Governance Innovation. And in the Bloor West Village area of the provincial capital, there's Dan Bresnitz, co-director of the Innovation Policy Lab at the U of T's Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy and the author of Innovation in Real Places, Strategies for Prosperity in an Unforgiving World. And we're delighted to welcome the three of you to TVO tonight for a conversation that is confounding a great number of people in this country and around the world, frankly. I want to start with uh, a couple of quotes from a couple of cabinet ministers just to set this up. Here's one from former cabinet minister Tony Clement, uh, who was a cabinet minister both federally and provincially and is currently the co-chair of Reshoring Canada, which is a private lobbying effort pushing for a bigger portion of global manufacturing in Canada, who said, the supply chain challenges that are happening now, we believe are just the tip of the iceberg, that this is going to be a continuing trend, particularly as the geopolitical situation deteriorates and the U.S. seeks to decouple some of its supply chain from China. And then we're going to quote Canada's finance minister today, Christian Freeland, who said in response to global supply problems, what we have seen in Canada and around the world is that shutting down an economy, as we had to do to fight COVID, is a simpler process than turning an economy back on. Turning an economy back on in Canada and around the world is inevitably uneven. Okay, to that end, Besma Momani, let's start with you. How should we understand the pressures internationally being put on supply chains everywhere right now? Well, they're fundamental, and part of it really is the shipping industry. This is really, I think, one of the key factors here. Uh, look, uh, COVID did a great number on all of us. Uh, one, it changed consumer behavior. Uh, all of us are now buying more. We're nesting. Uh, we want to make the comforts of home uh, exactly as we need them. Uh, we need computers and all these high-tech products that require semiconductors, causing a huge supply chain challenge. We also have the fact, as I said, shipping is a real big issue. You know, 80% of world trade goes on shipping. And uh, there's just a lot of ships, you know, waiting to dock uh, right now uh, in Los Angeles and other ports around the world. Uh, there's lack of, in, lack of efficiencies in some of those ports as well, which we can talk about later as well. Um, and certainly, I think, you know, the other issue is that productivity has gone down because of COVID. Uh, we've had social distancing in factories. We've had quarantines in some cases of uh, East Asian countries that had to shut down. Um, and lastly, I'd say labor market. You know, we heard about this great resignation. Uh, we hear about the, the YOLO effect. People are really kind of rethinking their lives. Uh, and what that means is there's less people working at docks who want to, again, offload, uh, you know, cargo because they're more interested in taking a job closer to home, let's say. Uh, the trucking sector is a huge issue. There's just not enough truckers. There was an enormous shortage of about 20,000, I believe, across North America. Um, and when there are jobs now to work in a warehouse, you know, fulfillment center, uh, why would you put yourself on the road? It's a all very old demographic too that work in that industry. So as you can see, there's just a lot of confounding factors here uh, that make it the mess that it is today. It's not one thing, um, but I certainly don't think it's uh, 
it's a, a short-term problem, and we'll talk about that, I'm sure, later. Sure. And just for the listeners and viewers who are my age and older, the acronym you use, YOLO, means you only live once, which uh -huh. is motivating a lot of what's going on, particularly in the States right now, as people quit jobs. Perrin Beatty, maybe you could focus in on the Canadian situation and explain to uh, our viewers and listeners uh, the impact of all of this on our businesses here in this country. Steve, we're seeing it across the board in, in all sectors. Uh, in conjunction with Statistics Canada, the Canadian Chamber does the Canadian survey on, on business conditions. The third quarter report uh, indicates that right across the, the board, we're seeing cost increases, we're seeing shortages in terms of inputs, whether domestically sourced or, or uh, internationally sourced. And uh, what we're finding is it's particularly hitting people in the manufacturing sector and in construction. But we're also hearing about it from the retail sector. Uh, for example, uh, we had a panel recently that Tina Lee from TNT Supermarkets was on, and she was making the point that if you see something that you're looking for to buy for your family for Christmas, do it now. It's it's apt not to be on the shelves as you get closer to Christmas. It's that simple. So it's a problem that is uh, that is compounding, and it affects all sectors. Well, you've anticipated my follow-up question, which is to say that as people do their Christmas shopping over the next five, six weeks, uh, waiting longer is not going to help. Is that your message to us today? That's the message. It certainly is. And the, the other problem here is that in some way these kinks in the supply chain compound each other. As people start hearing about shortages, they rush out either to stockpile or to get a product earlier. And that means the demand increases that much and the difficulty of keeping things stocked is that much more difficult. Dan, as you look at this issue, do you think there's anything that can actually be done now that would address these bottlenecks? Well, I think uh, I actually want to uh, even strengthen some of the things we heard. Uh, and first of all, I want to uh, have my prayer and wish to all the people around Vancouver speaking about ports and problems we have in ports and the storm that was there. So let me add climate change to the other problems that we have with global supply chain and the fact that they're completely unsustainable, environmentally speaking. Um, I think what COVID actually did is put a mirror in our face, which showed us the nobilities that were there for a very long time. Anyone who followed the semiconductor industry knew that the West, America specifically, is losing all touch with the ability to innovate in the production of semiconductors. The only country that is still doing it very well is Taiwan. And the China sort of coming up. And uh, that is not a surprise. What is was a surprise that because of COVID, suddenly we had massive demand for that and we have a disruption in the supply chain. Uh, so we have a structural problem of a way in which we have decided collectively to create a global supply chain, which are actually not global. Uh, they are vastly concentrated around the China region. Uh, we have climate change, we have COVID, we have horrific geopolitics coming upon us, and all of those things are a perfect storm, so I don't see how this is going to be solved. Uh, what I will uh, urge people uh, is to figure out, maybe not to the level of uh, your friend who wants to reshore everything to Canada, but thinking about how we create much more resilient uh, local or regional global supply chain that sort of complement each other because we should expect more and more crisis, global crisis, to hit us pretty damn soon. All right. Before we get there, though, I do want to go back to Perrin Beatty and find out you don't think this is going to be resolved before Christmas. You've told us that. Dan just told us he doesn't think this is going to be solved for a very, very long time. But businesses, Mr. Beatty, have to make plans. So how are they making plans right now? And, and what kind of timeline are they looking at? Well, in some cases, people are being asked to do ordering a year in advance. Um, so this is a major problem for them to anticipate what sort of needs they're going to have that far out to make the ordering and to make sure that they actually get the product. What, what's key here, Steve, is that that um, it, the, the key word is 
chain and supply chain. The supply chain is as strong as the weakest link. So if it's labor shortages, if it's shortages of, of uh, uh, shipping containers, if it's problems as a result of uh, the climate crisis that we're having on the West Coast right now that has effectively cut the port of Vancouver off from the rest of Canada, um, if it's uh, pandemic protectionism, if it's a case that suppliers are being shut down in some parts of the world because of, because of the spread of the disease, any one of these can affect, can affect the, uh, the supply chain and it compounds as you go along. So the, the, the challenge is to recognize, first of all, that there's not a silver bullet. There's not one answer to this. The problem is, is a series of problems that are layered on top of each other. Some of these are susceptible to being resolved in Canada. Uh, many of them aren't. And we're going to have to simply uh, concentrate on each of the links in the supply chain and where businesses are able to have an impact on that. For example, by diversifying suppliers or by increasing their inventory. Uh, or by nearshoring, if they can, if they can do that in time, uh, all of that uh, is in the toolkit that they can take a look at to see if they if they can uh, if affect the ability to get the products they need. Basma, I guess one of the things we need to better understand here is how much of what the world is experiencing right now is sort of an outgrowth of having dealt with COVID-19 for the last 19 months, and how much of this just sort of reveals vulnerabilities that would have been there regardless of COVID-19. Can you help us on that? Yeah, look, I think uh, as, as both, uh, uh, you know, my colleagues here have pointed out, these are structural problems. And so structural problems, you know, don't do well when you have the black swan event like a pandemic. So certainly COVID, you know, made everything topsy-turvy. But look, I think there are some real challenges here. Climate change is a real big one. Uh, this is not just happening in terms of getting products out, but even uh, in commodities, for example, right now, coffee. <laughs> you know, we have a decrease of 30% of production because of extreme weather between floods and droughts. Uh, we're seeing what's happening out west uh, that is going to prevent the movement of products so i think it is really intertwined um, and it's really hard to divorce one from the other um, look I, I think there are some things that we can do about it um, even though it is structural there is technology that can help uh, we are not leaders in this area and certainly the americans in particular are are terrible at it they really do need to upgrade their infrastructure we could do something about you know learning from uh, ports in Dubai and, and Rotterdam and other places where technology is widely used uh, from, you know, blockchain technologies, which is really a great way to bring in efficiencies and predictability. Uh, there's artificial intelligence, of course, with that that can be brought in. So there's quite a bit 5G. Uh, which we know is going to be, I think, a, a revolutionary change in our industry for um, all logistics and, and warehousing. So there's a lot that can be done that we need to get on with. Uh, I think this is a systemic problem that uh, is not going to go away, particularly because climate change is going to make things difficult. And again, back to the point of near sourcing and, and reshoring. I think that is a part of the, pro sorry, part of the solution. Mm -hmm. it, it's not to say we're going to do deglobalization and decoupling. That's just not going to happen. But maybe we'll start to sort of, you know, consider, huh, maybe we don't need to, uh, you know, rely on this one tiny little part that's coming all the way from Taiwan. Why can't we have a indigenous industry of semiconductors? I mean, I think we need to start having these kinds of conversations. Um, and it really is, I think, high time. Okay. But until we have those conversations, Dan, maybe you could, well, I'm, I'm, I'm putting myself in the head right now of people who are watching this and saying to themselves, wait a minute, I don't get this. There's a factory in China that makes a gizmo that I like to use. They make the gizmo, they put it on a boat, they send it to Canada. What's the big deal? Maybe you could explain to us the, the complexity of supply chains today, which really puts the lie to that story I just gave. So, uh, first of all, let's talk about the gizmo. So <laughs> let's assume the gizmo is a smartphone, like the one I have here. It's not that Chinese factories put the gizmo out of thin air. You actually have companies all around the world that, have, that, that design and come up with the idea of that smartphone. Then they source, and in a smartphone, you have more or less 10,000 components. All of them come, all of them have to work together. Somebody, actually not in China, usually design how they all fit together. You constantly have new materials just in a smartphone. Think about the smartphone that you have for the last five years. Then finally, it comes to China, all of those components from all around the world, at least 20 countries. Then they assemble it because they're the only one who know how to actually do it. Uh, then they put it on a ship that come back. 
Just think about the number of ships and airplanes that had to move around the world and get in order to get all the uh, commodities that then turns into components, that then turn to subsystem, that then turned and moved to that factory in order for the gizmo, as you called it, to be produced in China. That's a technical and term I use there, gizmo. Exactly. Yeah. And gizmos are now not do, are not being done in one place. Uh, gizmos are done all over. And uh, in, therefore, no matter what gizmo you want, Steve, uh, it is done all over the globe and has to be moved back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And when you have disruption in the supply chain, it's enough that just one back and forth doesn't work properly mm -hmm. and you have a problem. Well, let me go to Perrin Beatty on that then. Did, did we as a world, as an international business community, make a mistake with globalization in as much as we have left ourselves incredibly vulnerable to, as you've described it, only one link in the chain going south, and now we're vulnerable to everything. Supply chains have worked remarkably well. The surprise to me, frankly, Steve, during the pandemic has been how well they have worked. I initially expected a um, year and a half ago that we'd be seeing serious shortages of materials. Um, that, hasn't, that hasn't happened, and we've been fortunate in that. However, one of the things we very much need to do in Canada and in other countries as well is as we emerge from COVID, we need to do a full analysis of what are the lessons learned. How do we prepare for the next crisis? Uh, it could be a crisis caused by terrorism, cyber terrorism. It could be as a result of the climate catastrophe, or it could be a pandemic that would leave us looking wistful, wistfully at, at COVID-19. Um, so we have to ask ourselves, what sort of preparations do we have to make to ensure our security? Uh, I'm a former defense minister. One of the things you look at is the defense industrial base. And the question you ask yourself is, if there were ever a conflict, what would we have to be able to produce here in Canada or have very easy access to to be able to maintain our security? We need to apply the same questions across the board. We need to define security as much more than whether or not we're going to be invaded by China or by, by Russia, but rather what about our, our security in a time of a natural disaster or in time of terrorism or in time of a, a pandemic and ask ourselves, uh, do we have sufficient resiliency in the system that will enable us to function? So there are a number of ways in which you can do it. Uh, one of them is obviously to reshore, to bring things here. The problem with that is it's, ex it's very expensive to do. And it, you can price your, your goods out of international markets that way and simply lose your ability to compete. Another is that you can build stockpiles in advance, but again, that drives up costs. Another is that you can source from around the world, but diversify your sources. They aren't all in China. They're from other places as well. Uh, and we can also work, uh, the Prime Minister is meeting uh, President Lopez Obrador and President Biden. One of the things we should be doing is to talk about, uh, about the North American supply chain and what we can do to ensure resiliency within North America by relying on each other. All of these are potential options for us to look at. Let me ask Besma Momani about one of those options. Besma, how important do you think a potential solution to this problem is by just simply saying, we're going to make more things in Canada, period? Well, look, I think uh, we can hearken to those golden age, golden days when we did make a lot of more things, um, but I think it's just not going to happen. Look, the, the, the cost of labor is just too high. Uh, that's just the reality. Um, if we do reshore, it'll be through automation. It'll be through advanced manufacturing techniques. Again, it'll be through the application of technology. It won't be the return of uh, assembly jobs. It's just not going to happen. I think that that ship sailed quite literally. So I think, uh, you know, Mexico is still, as, as, as Perrin pointed out, I think it's really important to think about, you know, reshoring at least on the North American continent. I think we need to strengthen regionalization. We have a fantastic infrastructure in terms of this trade agreement to do that. Uh, and I already think that suppliers are probably rethinking, uh, you know, their options based on this. Um, how can we depend less on shipping? Again, because 80% of world trade is in shipping. What you want to do is have lots of options to bring things in, right? So when you do have a North American strategy, you can at least rely on potentially rail, which we need to invest a lot more in. Uh, you can rely on trucking, which again is not ideal. 
uh, because of uh, obviously pollution. But nevertheless, I think having more options, including air, which you know for some companies it's the it's the way to go. Peloton said we're just going to fly every bike in, and we're not going to have a supply chain problem. Um, and they just bypass the whole thing by avoiding shipping. So there's lots that can be done, but I do think a North American strategy is a part of the solution. I don't have one of those things, but you, you got to be prepared to pay four thousand dollars for an exercise bike right? Which is obviously beyond the means of so many people. So Dan, I'd put the same question to you. Making more things in Canada, is that an option here? Probably it's, uh, not, an, uh, it's not an option, it's a necessity. So uh, we haven't talked at all about geopolitics. Um, and we haven't talked at all about the geopolitics that are changing between supposedly offerings. Uh, I don't know if any one of you have noticed how the Americans talk now. They are not as friendly. Uh, I think Canada would do very well to map, as uh, my colleague here said, what is it that we need um, in order to uh, survive or actually thrive in the next crisis, because the next crisis will come. Within five to seven years, we should expect another one of those, at least. Um, and we should also figure out, uh, in this way, by the way, that Taiwan has shown us, where is power in those global supply chains? Because when you have power, even if it's one of those global supply chain, like semiconductors, you can then actually use it to get what you want in other supply chains in times of crisis. And we should uh, maybe, you know, start playing hockey. And in hockey, you actually sometimes need to take a penalty in order to score a goal. Um, and I think that time has arrived, even with our friends. Uh, okay, you better explain that metaphor for me. Sometimes you got because I follow hockey pretty carefully. And what do you mean you got to you got to take a penalty? To Sometimes score a goal. you have to play rough. Sometimes play rough. you say uh, the WTO rules are, for an example, of course, are those. Uh, but in order for us to be able to reshore or uh, to create a grace period for our own industry to become competitive, we're going to uh, say. We don't really care about World Trade Organization in this place. Fine us. That's our penalty. We still need to score that goal. Hmm. Perrin Beattie, are, uh, do you think Canada is capable of being uh, Tiger Williams or Ty Domi in, in international trade? I think it's important for us to understand that, that for we operate in a global marketplace. The goods that we produce here in Canada have to be competitive with the best and the cheapest anywhere in the world. And that means that we use our supply chains in order to, to get the best possible product at the lowest possible price. The problem today is that there are disruptions in those in those supply chains. It's simply not feasible for us to, uh, to bring everything to Canada. We don't grow oranges in Canada. It's unlikely unless climate change dramatically accelerates that we're going to be able to in our lifetimes. Um, there are other things that we can do. Um, for example, we haven't talked much about, about the political aspects of, uh, of supply chains. Um, we're, the Western industrialized democracies are very dependent upon China for the supply of critical minerals. However, here in Ontario and in Quebec, we have major supplies of critical minerals. We need to be looking at how can we uh, produce those in North America, in Canada, supply them to ourselves and to our strategic partners in North America so that we're not subject to political pressures from countries like China as well. So there are things that we can do and there are things that it doesn't make sense to do. We need to be judicious in terms of where we attempt to reshore and, and where we don't. Let me just use a, one example. We ran into serious problems during the pandemic with, uh, with N95 respirators. And we had Donald Trump engaging in pandemic protectionism, where he said, I'm not going to allow uh, N95s to be shipped from the United States into Canada for a time. That was a major concern. But if you look at the logic of supply chains, N95s are not terribly difficult to produce. It is precisely the sort of commodity that ordinarily you would be looking to source internationally as opposed to trying to produce much more expensively at home. What we learned during the pandemic is there may be some instances where to ensure our security in times of crisis, we may have no choice but to but to develop the capacity to produce at home. And that means in particular in the health sciences sector, we should be making a priority of that and looking at what we can do to backstop our capacity here in Canada.
Well, we've had a couple of answers now that have focused on China and whether we're too dependent on China. So let me introduce some stats here for our viewers and listeners and then come back and chat about that. Since 2001, Canada's trade with China has grown faster than Canada's trade with any other principal trading partner. During the COVID-19 epidemic, Canada's Office of the Chief Economist developed a framework for identifying products with limited international supply, and China was the top supplier for 158 of these products. That's second only to the United States. And in terms of our domestic production, this is according to StatsCan in 2016, almost half of Canada's production inputs have some Chinese content, which raises the question, Besma, of whether we are too reliant on China. What say you? Absolutely too reliant, uh, but so is the entire world. That, that's the challenge. The challenge is everybody is too reliant on China. And again, you can, I think, replace China with a different country at a different time. I mean, interdependency, just by virtue of the concept, is, is you know, it's vulnerability. Uh, we are vulnerable by being interdependent. Uh, and again, things work like clockwork when there aren't pandemics and when there aren't geopolitical challenges and when there aren't climate change. But all of those things are heightened at the moment. Um, and so we haven't even got into the geopolitical challenges that exist with China today. And I would also add that Chinese government is very different than it was previously. We have a, a leader today, President Xi, that's very nationalistic. Uh, he's also talking about dual circulation theory, which is being more independent domestically. So to, for them to be less interdependent on us, can you imagine that? Uh, and so I think this is all just to contribute to the argument that we do need to think about these things more critically. I think we just sort of had too much faith in globalization and interdependence to, the, to, to, our, own, um, to our own fault. Uh, and then now it's time to sort of rethink, it, rethink it, uh, add to the fact that again, climate change is, is here to stay, unfortunately. So we need to rethink these supply chains no matter what. Dan, should we, can we break our dependence on China? Well, first of all, I think that the one, well, statistically they have shown because I, I actually want to defend globalization uh, to a degree, if you just think about what it did for most of humanity. But the, the reality is we didn't have a globalization. We had a very skewed globalization where the whole world became more and more dependent on one really tiny region of the world, if you think globally. We did do not have global production or global supply chain. We have a Chinese dominant supply chains, and that's the problem. Uh, and so we need to do something about that. Even if China was the most friendliest, uh, democratic, uh, human-loving nation the world have ever seen, this resiliency in time of pandemic, in time of climate crisis, um, is just not sustainable. We have to figure out how we create much more resilient global and regional supply chain. And Canada have to start to have this debate because other countries are already doing that. It sounds, though, Perrin Beatty, that if, if we try to pursue those other options, they're all going to be more expensive, uh, or at least hard to do. So what's the incentive for doing them? Supply. It's that, that you don't run out of, the, out of the materials that you need, that you're able, particularly times of crisis, to be able to protect your security and to provide the services that are essential. Uh, it's important, Steve, for us to understand here, when we use the term global supply chain, that, that the issue, the problem is global. It's not susceptible to being resolved here entirely by Canada acting on its own. And countries around the world are wrestling with the same issue. And businesses around the world are wrestling with this issue. So we need to work in conjunction with others to do this. We also need to look at what elements of the supply chain issues uh, are susceptible to being resolved here in Canada. Uh, for example, the issue of truck drivers. Now, even if you can bring something from China, land it at the port of Vancouver, even if the port of Vancouver is open and not cut off from the rest of the country, uh, you still need truck drivers to be able to get the product to, to where it's going. That's an issue that others aren't going to resolve for us. We have to resolve that, that here in Canada. So we need a very focused effort in terms of what we can do here, and we need to collaborate with other partners to, uh, to uh, resolve the international aspects. And at the end of the day, there's no question that there are going to be elements of this that are going to be more expensive. But if the alternative is that everything shuts down, because we can't get our hands on the supplies we need, that would be the most expensive of, of all. Besma, down to our last minute. Can we do this? We can. Uh, it takes a bit of a culture change, too. 
uh, I think we need to start thinking about uh, buying local, uh, thinking about, you know, what is it that we can, uh, you know, consume uh, based on what we can grow in the earth. Uh, maybe we shouldn't be having oranges in the month of, of November. Uh, maybe it's just, I think, unrealistic and we should be thinking about squash and pumpkin. Uh, I think there are lots of changes that can be done. Boy, there's a lot of people right now who are going to want their OJ in the morning who aren't going to like that. But as you say, we got to do things differently, maybe? Yeah, so uh, I have to say one other thing, and I actually uh, have an op-ed on that in policy reports last year. If we want to have more things being done in Canada, we have to create stable local demand. Uh, that's both businesses, but it's also the government. Um, for example, if I buy something in the supermarket, especially if it's a sophisticated gizmo like you love, Steve, <laughs> I want to know how much of it is actually produced where. Currently, I don't know. So even if I want to be best man, be a good Canadian, I can't do that. We need to figure out ways in order to create demand for locally produced and sourced products from drugs to gizmos. Dan, you're actually not getting the last word today. You, you're going to have the last word on Monday because you're going to join us again on Monday when we talk about your new book, Innovation in Real Places. So thank you for joining us tonight. And to Perrin Beatty and Besmo Momani, our gratitude as well for your contribution to our program tonight. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you. As difficult as these past many months have been, we are by no means the first to live through tough times. Far from it. Writer, teacher, and former politician Michael Ignatieff is given to thinking deeply about things, usually political. His new book, however, covers quite different traditions of thought reaching across the centuries for wisdom from other eras of great hardship. The book is called On Consolation, Finding Solace in Dark Times. Michael Ignatiev is a professor of history at the Central European University, and he joins us now from Vienna, Austria. And it's great to have you back on our airwaves, Michael Ignatiev. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Steve. Good glad to, to see you. Glad to hear that. This book, let's just talk the background first, because it has its origins in an experience that you had back in 2017, invited to give a talk at a choral festival in Utrecht, arranged around the Book of Psalms. What happened there? I gave this lecture about justice and politics in the Psalms, and then Susanna and I spent the weekend with you know a couple thousand other people listening to four great choirs perform settings of the Psalms that went back to you know Augustinian plain chant right up to the modern day, and the experience was just overwhelming. Uh, it tears of recognition in the audience, uh, and I had a tremendous sense of surprise because I don't. You know, I, I, my dad was religious, but I'm not particularly religious. My brother is religious, but I'm not. Um, and uh, so discovering the power of the Psalms, their, their comforting power and their consoling power was an enormous surprise. And so I then began a search to understand why religious language like this would have a power to soothe and comfort and console people who don't actually happen to believe in the, the promise of, of religious faith. So that's where it started, just figuring out why, why religious language moved me so deeply. Let's do an excerpt from the book and follow up on that. Consolation, you write, has also lost its institutional setting. The churches, synagogues, and mosques, where we once consoled each other in collective rituals of grief and mourning, have been emptying out. If we seek help in times of misery, we seek it alone from each other and from therapeutic professionals. They treat our suffering as an illness from which we need to recover. Yet when suffering becomes understood as an illness with a cure, something is lost. Okay, let's follow up there. What do we lose? I think we lose some sense that suffering is just part of the human experience. Um, suffering goes with the territory, join the club. Um, it's not an illness from which we need to recover, although sometimes it can feel like an illness. And I don't want to knock the therapeutic professionals who often do such a good work helping people to convert, as Freud once said, hysterical misery into common unhappiness. But the traditions that I was trying to excavate in this book all, all see suffering as just an inevitable, even necessary part of life, and then try to figure out ways in which we can, can 
can console ourselves for loss, for pain, for uh, the loss of loved ones um, and the suffering that that leads to. Well, in fact, you take us over more than 2,000 years through a variety of uh, important historical figures uh, as we try to understand this. So we're going to go through some of them right now. And let's start with Paul's epistles. You write that Paul created a language of consolation that was the first and most powerful language of human equality ever created. How so? Well, it's in, it's in uh, Paul's epistle to the Galatians in which he says, you know, there is neither bound nor free, neither male nor female, but all are one in Jesus Christ. Um, this explosive revolutionary claim that uh, neither gender nor origin nor national origin nor race nor religion um, uh, could divide human beings, that, that God had made us equal in this sense, a pretty revolutionary doctrine, and I think is the source of the, all the visions of human equality that have gone on ever, ever since. Um, you know, Paul starts his life as a persecutor of the Jews. He's a zealot. And then he discovers, um, uh, as he begins to spread the Christian word across the Eastern Mediterranean uh, in the decades after the death of Christ, uh, he discovers that he can make this message work. He can gather believers in from every form or faith, every kind of person, uh, the rich, the poor, the excluded, the included. Um, and, and that gives him this incredibly powerful sense that religious language can speak to everybody. And I think that is the source of a very new idea of human equality in, in, uh, in history. Let's go to Roman imperial times and talk Cicero. He had devoted his life to the Roman Republic, and which was under attack by Caesar, of course, and he loses his daughter at this time. How does Cicero's approach to consolation perhaps still exist today in many men, in your view? Well, Cicero is particularly fascinating to me because in February 45, this is the most famous Roman politician of his day, the great rhetorician, you know, formidable guy in a classroom, in a courtroom, and he um, writes famous letters of consolation. Consolatio is a is a, a genre in Roman uh, politics or in Roman uh, discourse. And suddenly he loses his daughter. And the interesting thing to me, and you see it in his letters, uh, he suddenly comes apart. He falls apart. He has a complete collapse. And then the interesting thing is that all his male friends say, come on, Cicero, get back on your horse, get over this. Uh, your display of tears, your display of weakness here is endangering you politically. If people discover that you're, you've come apart like this, you're going to lose all your prestige and authority as a politician. And so gradually, painfully, he... Um, returns to the public square as Cicero, the manly Republican defender uh, of, uh, of uh, you know, political freedom in, in Rome. And the cost of this, I try to argue, is that that tradition of Roman virtue associates um, masculinity with never crying, uh, holding back the tears. Uh, tears are for women. Uh, when men console themselves, they must console themselves without tears. Uh, you must be stoic. And I think this, uh, in other words, consolation is very gendered. And I think that uh, men have paid a high price over the centuries for this line about masculinity and masculine self-control that starts with people like Cicero. Let's move 500 years into the future then with um, sixth century Rome. Boethius wrote The Consolation of Philosophy. How is his approach to consolation different from Cicero's or even Paul's before him? Well, Boethius is um, a, a Roman senator who is sentenced to death by the barbarian king, Theoderic. And so he writes this incredible um, book called The Consolation of Philosophy uh, while awaiting execution. And it's, it's inspired people for a thousand years. Uh, and what interested me about Boethius is, did writing the consolation of philosophy console him? 
the great uh, British historian of Rome, Edward Gibbon, thought that Boethius just put on a performance, that writing did not console him, in fact. And that's a question throughout the whole book. Uh, does writing, uh, does trying to find meaning for suffering actually console us for suffering? Um, and it's, a, it's, a, it's uncertain what the answer is, because there are such some experiences for which we are properly inconsolable. There's nothing you can say. I think when, when we've consoled someone who's lost their beloved wife or beloved husband, they're just inconsolable. There's nothing you can say. And so consolation is always the attempt to give meaning to suffering and loss, but sometimes no meaning is available. So Boethius is fascinating to me because he's about to be executed and he's trying to find a way to give meaning to this terrible experience. And it's not clear that he succeeds in consoling himself. Apropos of what you just said, that there are some circumstances for which there is no consolation at all, you do write about a friend of yours who is trying to come to grips with uh, the death of, a, of that person's child. And, and I'm, I have to tell you, the, the explanation that your friend gave just did not ring true to me at all. And I want you to help me understand it because he said to you, I thought she had been spared suffering. Her life had been complete. It was full. She lived it. She was spared the rest. She died at eight years old, that child. How could he possibly believe that she had lived a full life by eight? Steve, it's a mystery to me, too. I, I, I tell the story in the book because I respect the man who told it to me, and he's a musician that, whose work I've listened to, and um, he told me unbidden that rather stunning, shocking story that his, his little daughter was uh, killed in a sudden car accident at age eight, one of those things you just can't imagine uh, living through uh, as a parent. And, but he did say that. He said, um, I am consoled by the thought that she had a complete life. I am consoled by the thought that she didn't suffer, that she died instantly. I am consoled that she was spared some of the sorrow that I have lived in a full life. This man was in, now in his 70s. I find it hard to understand that. I don't in this book, I'm not trying to justify all the ways in which we find consolation. I'm just recording that in this case, this idea that his daughter was spared the suffering that would have come from a full life seemed to console him. Did it really? You'd have to ask him. And I don't, I, I don't even know that he would be sure of the answer. Hmm. Okay. Let's uh, zoom ahead to the 19th century here and talk Karl Marx. How did Marx try to get rid of consolation altogether? Well, I'm, uh, this is a book about uh, traditions of consolation that are religious, and it's also about the revolt against consolation. We need to remember how angry the idea of consolation has made people through the ages. People feel that... Um, uh, consolation adjusts us to, reconciles us to injustice, to cruelty, to suffering. We're told to endure, be reconciled to uh, terrible things. And one of the things I try to argue about the French revolutionaries and also Marx is that at the root of their politics was a rebellion against consolation, a rebellion against the idea that we should suffer and be still, we should wait for, you know, um, paradise, we should wait for the afterlife. No, he wanted, he wanted justice here now on earth. And I, the young Marx, uh, who's in Paris in 1844, 1845, he's in love, he's had his first child, is a very appealing figure, um, struggling to liberate himself from the hold of religious consolation and trying to, he's the one who says, you know, religion is a haven in a heartless world. He understands religion, he respects religion, but he rebels from the bottom of his soul against the ways in which religion seeks to adjust us to injustice. And from that, I think he begins to generate an image of revolution, a vision of revolution in which um, human beings will bring about, you know, <laughs> heaven on earth, not 
not in the afterlife. And I think this is a way to understand what Marx was trying to do is that it's essentially a rebellion against religious consolation. And I think in the 20th century, it doesn't need to be said very strongly, we've paid a hell of a price for the people who lived through that dream and tried to build heaven on earth. Uh, it, it was a chapter that convinced me once more, if I needed convincing again, that I'm an anti-revolutionary figure. I mean, I'm a liberal, which means I'm against having those kind of hopes for politics. I think it's incredibly dangerous. And in the 20th century, we've paid a horrendous price for that. But I think we need to understand where it came from. And it came from a very deep and essentially honorable and courageous rebellion against religion. Let's stay in the 20th century and the works of Primo Levi. You write about the Holocaust and, and you know, one does have to ask how one can possibly find any sort of consolation in the aftermath of such an egregious episode of history. Well, I don't think you can. I think that's why I put Primo Levi in the, in the book. I also put the great Russian poet Anna Akhmatova, who lived through Stalin's terror, and I talk about a great Hungarian poet as well who died in the Holocaust. What interests me is that, and let's go back to Primo Levi. Primo Levi was the, the great witness of Auschwitz uh, for from 1945 to his death in 1987, he wrote The Great Reckoning with Auschwitz, The Great Acts of Witness. And my question is not about Levy, it's about us, whether we can derive consolation from the fact that he was a witness who survived. Very often, Primo Levi became a kind of alibi, uh, the counterexample to man's inhumanity to man and I think the question I ask is whether we have a right, whether we should be consoled by his heroic acts of witness, because it seems to me that um, Levy himself said, I don't want to be your alibi. What happened at Auschwitz was an abomination. And the fact that I have lived to tell the tale doesn't take away one iota of the horror of that. And in fact, my job as a witness is to force you to see that and see what it tells you about human beings. And so, you know, in the 20th century, the idea of being consoled at all runs right up against man's inhumanity to man. And Primo Levi is the great, is the great witness, but also the one who asks us most troublingly whether we deserve to be consoled for the Holocaust. And his answer very firmly is no. Hmm. Finding consolation as one faces death. You write about Cicely Saunders and the hospice movement that she helped found. What can she teach us? Well, I, you know, um, Steve, when my, my dad died, um, he died very suddenly of a heart attack in a Quebec hospital. And I, I was on the other side of the Atlantic, so I couldn't get there. And I've always been, felt sad. I don't feel guilty, but I feel terribly sad and upset at the thought that my dad died alone, all hooked up to monitors and stuff in a hotel, in a hospital. Um, my mother likewise died in a hospital in, in, I thought, sort of terrible situation. My brother was there, I was there, we did our best, but it, it wasn't great. And. Cicely Saunders, this wonderful English woman, English nurse who became a doctor and invented the whole idea of palliative care and along with a number of other great people, including some great Canadians, created the hospice movement, understood that uh, in your final days or weeks, even when the doctors have said there's nothing more we can do for you, there's still a very important moment at the end of life where you can be find, achieve peace with your loved ones resolve family quarrels, uh, say the thing you never said to your son or your daughter or your father or your mother. All these things, the, the, the making peace with your life is a matter of being consoled about your life. But you have to have a place in which you can do that. And this is what Cicely Saunders understood. You had to create a place and you had to create 
a regime of medication and care that will allow a person to say goodbye to their life at peace with life. And that's, I think, the, the connection, in other words, between hospice and consolation is very important. Hospice is the place where consolation can occur. And that was, I think, her, her incredible insight. And I, I had the privilege of meeting her once uh, way back in 1996. I've never forgotten. And she was this crisp English county lady, you know, and she was just fantastic woman, just bursting with life and hope. And she spent her whole life helping people to die, but I've never met anybody with more vitality or love of life. And uh, so I, she's the final chapter of the book. Because you mentioned your father in that answer, I, I wanted to follow up there because many people watching this right now may not know George Ignatieff, great Canadian diplomat, was your father. There's a theater at the University of Toronto named after him. And, and I, I ask you this question well, let me start with a bit of a confession, which is to say that my father's father, when he died, was only 51. And I know that when my father passed 51, I exhaled pretty good. And uh, your dad died at 75, and you're now 74. And I'm just wondering if that math is resonating with you at all. Oh, sure. Steve, I say absolutely, absolutely. I, I have a cousin who who's no longer with us, but he exhaled loudly when he passed the year 48 um, because his father had died at 48. I think all men, all women do the same. Um, we're, we are so emotionally deeply tied to the lifespan of our parents. And, uh, um, and I feel very sad that my father didn't get more time. 75 is not a particularly uh, old age to die and, and the death of your your big guy at 51 is a, you know, wow. It's a, I, I think these are the things we can struggle with all our, all our life. And uh, it's part of the business of being consoled and in a sense reconciled to life. Um, it, and, and what's difficult is to understand this is this is something over which we have no control. We don't know how long the span will be. It's in the genetics, it's in accidents, in contingency. A little bit in the way we live, yes, but uh, when our time comes, it's not, we don't get to choose when our time comes. And that, that's, that's just a painful reality of being who we are. Uh, given that every time you and I talk, politics somehow usually manages to get into the conversation, you are going to be completely unsurprised by this next question. And that is, um, well, you didn't write about this in the book, but I do want to ask you about you, because when you were leader of the Liberal Party of Canada, uh, you had the, uh, the poor timing, let me put it that way, of leading the party to, uh, at that time, its worst uh, outcome in Canadian history. And I want to know yeah. how you managed to find consolation in that, yeah, I, I, I think there's no doubt you you don't write a book about consolation unless you've been thinking about certain losses um, uh, and the defeat in um, 2011 was one of them. It's a long time ago. Um, how did I find consolation? Um, I, I think the interesting question is whether you can be truthful about the consolation you find. That is, to give you an example, when you think about your defeat in 2011, you, you say to yourself, here's how you console yourself. You say, I gave it my best shot. I did, did the best I could. Well, is that really true? You know, <laughs> Wasn't there something else you could have done? Um, I think that's one of the things I've, I have had to face is just whether I have been truthful about the ways in which I've consoled myself. Uh, and I've, I've, I've come to see that, uh, you know, I should take a hell of a lot of responsibility for what happened, but not all of the responsibility. And, um, and I'm also here to tell you there's a hell of a great life to be had after politics. One of the chapters in the book is about Václav Havel. And I found that particularly revealing. Here's a guy, great leader of the Czech opposition who's in jail in 1983. And what he's worried about and what he's trying to, to figure out is how to get up over a moment earlier in his career when he would betrayed his principles. And he was haunted by this failure of his. And, um, 
And it's out of this struggle to be truthful with himself that he coined the phrase that I, I, I think is associated with his name, which is, we must live in truth. And living in truth is damn hard. You know, I mean, you, you um, constantly put up a smoke screen of, of illusions about failure, and you have to strip those away and look at failure straight on and not kid yourself and not fool yourself. And so that's the that's the dialectic of being consoled by failure. You have to you have to find a way to be consoled by failure, but be truthful to yourself and to others. I suppose I should just remind everybody at this point that the 2000 election, 2004, 2008, am I forgetting when? Yes, 2006, 2011 when you came along, the Liberals lost seats in every single one of those elections. You happened to be at yeah. the end of a time when the Liberals were really, you know, facing the end of their cycle in power. So yeah. I'm, I'm only saying this because you you, you, you got to be careful how you use the word failure. I mean, you get to be responsible for some of that, but not all of that, right? Yeah, that's very, ni <laughs> very nice of you to say so. Well, uh, I, you know, I just think yeah, yeah, we got to be adults here. You got to, you got to, you got to uh, shoulder up. I mean, I, I, about that period, I feel uh, a sadness that I, disappointed the faith that people put in me that's that's the part that's painful i you know i hate to disappoint people and i love the people i work with and one of the lies about politics is that there are no friends in politics or i we've still got a ton of friends in politics a decade later people i love to stay in contact with but i still feel a sense of sadness that i wish i'd you know got there with them and been able to you know, take them to the place we wanted to go. Um, so, you know, but that's life. We are happy to remind people the book is called On Consolation, Finding Solace in Dark Times. And we are always delighted when his latest brings Michael Ignatieff back to our airwaves here on TVO. Thank you again. Thank you, Steve. Great, great to see you. Great to talk to you as always. And that is the agenda for Wednesday, November 17th, 2021. Kids have missed many opportunities during this pandemic. Tomorrow we'll find out about the state of extracurricular activities and are playgrounds in the province substandard? We're looking at that too. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow.